The League of Women Voters, Metro North Chamber of Commerce, and North Suburban Optimists welcome you to meet the candidates for those running for City Council of the City of Columbia Heights. We thank the candidates for their participation. And we thank the City of Columbia Heights for assistance from the Communication and Events section and for the use of City Council Chambers to make this event possible. This forum is being broadcast live on both the City of Columbia Heights Facebook stream and on local cable channels 16 and 19. If you can't watch the forum in its entirety right now, it's about going to be about an hour long, you can view the recorded forum at the LWB ABC website or on the LWB ABC YouTube channel. You can also find links on the City of Columbia Heights Facebook page and the City of Columbia Heights YouTube channel. And it will also be shown frequently on the cable, local cable channels as well. This year, the League of Women Voters is holding our Meet the Candidates forums without an audience to avoid COVID-19 spread. Questions for this forum were submitted online in advance. My name is Gretchen Sable. I'm a trained moderator for the League of Women Voters of Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids area. Our league serves all of Anoka County. I live in Andover, so I can't vote for these candidates. All candidates for this race were invited to participate in the forum. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any political parties or candidates for office. I'm sure that these candidates care very much who you vote for, but the League doesn't care who you vote. We do care that you vote, and we hope that each of you will vote. The goal of our forums is to help citizens become informed voters. The candidates for City Council with us tonight are Connie Biskins, Laura Dorley, Kay, KT Jacobs, and Andy Newton. There are two seats open for this election. We'll begin with three questions that were provided to the candidates in advance. This will be followed by questions that were submitted online in advance to LWV ABC. The candidates will alternate who answers each question first, and answers are limited to one minute and will be timed. Hi everyone, I would like to thank the Women of League voters for hosting this forum, and I would like to thank everyone at home for taking the time to watch our forum. I have lived in Columbia Heights with my husband for the last 21 years. Um, and, as, and for um, community involvement, I am a member of Heights Next, Sister City, and the Beautification Committee. Um, in the past five, six, seven years, I've been very much involved with our community, starting out with the Beautification Committee and uh, setting up the Girl Scouts Pollinator Garden up at the City Community Garden. Um, other things, and since I've been on the council, I've been all over involved with lots of different events or just attending from the high school spring musical, neighborhood watch group, um, plant exchanges, swearing in ceremonies for our new um, police officers, and recently with COVID I've been volunteering in the Blooming Sunshine Edible Garden in Lomiaki and delivering produce for leftover for two chicken keepers in town from leftover from Seika. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like Gretchen said, my name is Laura Dorley and I'm honored to be here as your neighbor and as a candidate for Columbia Heights City Council. Um, I'm also very grateful to all of my neighbors who supported me in the primary uh, so that I can be here with you all today. So um, for the last 10 years, I've dedicated my career to community organizing. I've worked across the political spectrum in the government and nonprofit sector, including running a statewide environmental organization. I have also successfully passed policies at the state, federal, and local level. Um, around social, economic, um, and environmental justice. For example, I played an important role in getting multiple municipalities to commit to 100% renewable electricity by 2040. Um, locally, I have made it a priority to build relationships with neighbors, local business owners, and community groups, and it's been so fun to get to know even more throughout the campaign. I have extended family across the northern metro here. Um, I personally grew up in St. Cloud, the oldest of five in my big Catholic family. I have a policy and management degree from the University of Minnesota, and I live at McKenna Park, or near McKenna Park, with my dog Buddy and two orange tabby cats, Jorge and Pumpkin. Thank you. Hi, I am very glad to be here this evening, and um, as well as the other candidates, thank the League of Women Voters for making this possible for the residents. I'm a 27-year resident of Columbia Heights. I have been on the Charter Commission for the past two years. I chaired the Complete Count Committee for the 2020 Census, and was instrumental in the enactment of a city ordinance enabling the tenure census workers legal access to all high density residential structures. We were one of the first communities in the state to get this accomplished, even when it was not accomplished at the state level. 
I'm a member of the Centennial Celebration Committee and leading one of the larger events slated for 2021. I'm a member of the Columbia Heights Lions and I'm also a community volunteer. I have almost 30 years experience in multi-level managerial positions in the printing industry. I'm retired from the airline and have spent the have spent about 12 years walking the hallways in Washington, D.C. on, on uh, preventing um, casualty and, and adding to the safety factors for crew members. I currently hold credentials as a labor assistance professional, and I'm happy to be available to the community. Uh, hey, um, so thank you, League of Women Warriors, um, for this opportunity, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, <clears throat> I was raised by two public school teachers in a small town about this size. I've had a variety of jobs, from summer camp staff to teacher's assistant, even doing a stint in corporate America. Now I drive a truck and do service work for a furniture company. Uh, my wife and I bought a house here five years ago. Uh, we live there with our seven-year-old daughter, who attends Valley View Elementary. We're active members of the PTO and participate in the Indian Ed program. I'm also an artist and a musician. I'm a member of the temp, uh, neighborhood organization Heights Next. I have helped as a volunteer for both Pride events, and I'm heading up a planning committee for next year's Columbia Heights Arts Festival. It's first. Uh, we've regularly attended and enjoyed many city events, such as Jubilee, and until I announced my candidacy, I had been one of the main admins for the largest Columbia Heights specific social networking page, the Peace of the Community. Thank you. So, um... I'm running, as you know, to become your next city council member um, alongside one of the, the three people besides, besides me who I know care deeply about our city as well. Um, and that's really the first reason that I'm um, running is I love our community. Um, I've fallen in love with it since moving here. Um, and secondly, I believe in our collective innovation and creativity to um, rise to the challenges that uh, we're facing right now um, in 2020 and moving forward. Um, and I also have a strong people-centered vision to build a future where every person and local business is welcome, safe, and thriving. Our population has seen um, around a 60% turnover in recent years. We have many new young people like myself, uh, families, and immigrants that have joined our community. And I am committed to proactively reaching out to them as well as neighbors who have lived here their whole lives um, to make um, Columbia Heights an even stronger community. Um, and my experience in municipal government and background in policy and management make me uh, well qualified for the position. Thank you. Um, I'm the only unseated candidate in this election race that has um, uh, been for the previous three years been very active and has attended almost every work session, okay. council meeting, economic development, commission meetings. This included the commission interviews and appointments for 2020, which is something new that the city is doing. I have an extensive management background and have decades of experience in innumerable team settings requiring compromise to achieve the resolution's desire. I've spent hundreds of hours in the past three years in the community, not only as a resident, but as a community activist speaking to others about their concerns, their needs, and their wants and desires for this community. Uh, I honestly believe the most important qualification is to be a concerned, active member of the community. So in addition to that, I hold a bachelor's degree in recreation, parks, and tourism administration, yes, just like the TV show, uh, which means I have an educational background in accessing, accessing the needs of the community, engaging resources required to address those needs, then budgeting, analyzing uh, the programs you develop. Um, that sounds like it would transfer well to run, uh, running a city. You're right, it would. And uh, I have a minor in focusing on group dynamics and conflict resolution, which prepares me to handle those sessions that might not run as smoothly as one would hope. Um, so why am I running? For transparency. To try to bring about a more open and accessible city council. I'm running because it's time for some fresh perspectives on what our city is and can be, especially when it comes to listening to the voices of people of color, uh, the LBGTQ plus community, and others. Hi everyone. Um, first I'll start with why. I enjoy being of service to the residents of our city, and with your support, I would like to continue serving you and improving our quality of life, working on the issues and the projects that you care about. And then as far as experience and, and background, um, I was on the planning commission for at least two years and a city council member for the last three and a half years or so. 
Um, during this time, I've taken advantage of attending many different conferences, the League of City Conference here in Minnesota. I was uh, honored to attend the National League of City Conference in San Antonio, where I learned a ton, and also the um, Sustainability Conference in Dubuque, Iowa. I have sat on various committees for Metro Council and League of Cities that dealt with finance, transportation, housing, and economic development, and I've also been sent to by staff to other uh, workshops and things so I can continue to learn more to better our city. Thank you. Uh, Short-term goals, um, increasing owner-occupied housing, and this is not about anti-renters, it's about opening up the opportunities for those residents to invest further in the community by purchasing a permanent residence. Licensed rentals right now are about 44% of approximately 8,000 addresses in the city. It's, um, that's only the licensed units. There is reason to believe that a substantial number of unlicensed that would push us towards further, further towards the 50% mark or possibly even higher. Tax revenue is uncollected at, at appropriate levels. It results in licensing fees and, and the effect directly on renters' health and well-being living in uninspected un housing for the, uh, as a side effect of unlicensed rentals. Historically, data shows neighborhoods with higher numbers of rentals home sell at low, lower rates. There are other communities around the area that have um, income or uh, excuse me density caps on their on in their in their processes, and I think that's something we need to consider. Okay, I'm going to try to get through this. Um, short term, one establish regularly scheduled town halls allowing for full participation by the public in important conversations. We need to hear more from our neighbors and they need to feel heard. Uh, number two, reestablishing the Columbia Heights Arts Commission. We did have one. It was limited in 2015. The arts bring us together in so many ways and they deserve a seat at the table. Uh, number three, reexamining update and updating our parks. Our current parks and facilities, are they meeting the needs of changing demographics? Do we should we add soccer fields, dog parks, programs for teens? Let's move forward on some things and see what else we need. Uh, long term, more walkable streets for our kids, our elders, social special needs, safer street crossings, sidewalks, traffic studies, uncontrolled intersections. Um, Central Avenue, let's make it a place businesses want to be, place consumers want to frequent. Um, let's look at our ordinances, let's look at the winter parking ban, see if we need to reevaluate. Um, let's make sure our property ordinances are in line with allowing for sustainable development, for food plots, for pollinators, for wildlife, etc. Short-term goals right now are the completion of our new city hall and the electric apartment building that we're building at 40th and Central. I don't know if you guys have been down there, but I've been down there almost every day watching it come down. It's super exciting. Uh, continue supporting our facade grant program for small businesses. I would like to work on creation of sustainability commission for our city and revamp the traffic commission. Long-term goals. Um, I would like to increase our community policing, uh, continue cleaning up Central Avenue and redevelopment along the, uh, Central Avenue and possibly University and explore. Last time I mentioned exploring alternative funding sources to improve our parks on Monday night the council voted to add monies that was from decertified TIF going into a park for capital improvements on parks so I would love to get your vote so that I can help work on that and improve our parks. Yeah. Uh, so first off, this, there's so much packed into this question that it's hard to get into with just a minute. Um, so I'm just going to take a bird's eye view um, to the vision that I have uh, for the city. Um, and I, I also just want to um, emphasize too that it's been it's been so awesome to have hundreds of conversations with people across the city, across race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, um, immigration status, and that's really what's shaped um, what issues that I want to work on. Um, and so the three top priorities that I have are first, um, the safe and sustainable infrastructure, um, first and foremost, our streets and our parks, um, making sure that they are multimodal so that people who walk and bike, take public transit or get around in cars can be safe to do so. Um, and also, also along with that, um, that we are developing with the Vision Zero principle. Um, there have been many recent pedestrian um, and bike accidents in our city that have unfortunately been fatal. And that's not something we should have in our community. Um, so the second thing is supporting and growing our small business community, um, expanding our resources for small businesses and, um, and um, incentives to bring more into our community, and then making sure that everyone has quality affordable housing. Well, um, the thing that I've heard most from um, folks that I've been talking to in town is that 
we need to put a lot more focus on our teens. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of good adult programs. There's a lot of programs for smaller kids, but the parents keep saying, what have you got for my teenager? Um, if teenagers don't have enough to do, we were all teenagers, we get into trouble. We, we will find something to do. Um, so let's take that energy, let's direct it uh, in a positive way, in a creative way. Let's look at arts programs, let's look at uh, more sports programs, let's get a soccer field going, let's get a couple soccer fields. Um, let's look at theater, let's look at music. There's a lot of ways to engage teens, we just have to decide that we want to do it. Um, this question has come up several times over the last few years, many times actually. Um, Teens need places to go and something to do. Um, my biggest thing is focusing on um, redeveloping Immersion Hall. We have to do a lot of repairs and it's coming up um, on the budget to start working on the next year or two. Place to have them where they can hang out, more programs like uh, Mr. Newton talked about as far as Ellis programs for teenagers, soccer fields, big time, skateboard park, big time. Place things for them to do and places for them to go that are safe and their parents don't have to worry about them and maybe find other volunteer type organizations can, that can use teenagers' help with different things there. Yeah, thank you. So this, this issue is deeply personal to me um, because I know for, for one that a lot of the opportunities that I had as a young person growing up in St. Cloud are what made me the person I am today. Um, it's also personal because I'm not a parent right now, but I want to be in the future in Columbia Heights, and I plan to send my um, future kids to the public school system. And so I would say that um, the public schools are um, one of the top priorities for me, and that's not something that the city you know, has direct control over, but I want to make sure that there are strong partnerships with the school board. Um, and that through my, uh, you know, our community-centered work, we're really um, learning the things that our, our families and kids in the community are wanting um, and deserve both in the school system and outside, um, like some of the other candidates have, have mentioned. Um, and also opportunities for career development, um, partnerships in the community for um, career training and apprenticeships, apprenticeships and um, so forth. So. Um, I agree with the other candidates in terms of focusing on the teen market, um, what we need to provide for them. But I'd also like to see us develop some programs that would involve them civically in the community. Um, it's a great way for juniors and seniors in high school to add uh, bullet points to their resumes and it teaches them firsthand how government can work and how that process, those processes develop. So I think between the two, finding a balance and finding um, a way to engage those teens in, in the programs that we could propose. I think the marketing to the teens is going to be instrumental. Um, I briefly, for like two years, I think in the mid-2000s, um, had an eBay store where I sold um, antiquated um, Christmas stockings from cutting, cutter quilts, antique cutter quilts. Did that for a couple of years. Um, as a council member, I've been advocating for small businesses. Um, I initiated came to the um, city manager and asked him if we could do a grant program a grant program to do new, um, create uh, improve facades in our small businesses on Central Avenue. He liked the idea, staff liked the idea, and fortunately the council loved the idea and they voted yes for it, so that came through. Um, we also uh, voted yes just recently for a grant program to help small businesses with COVID expenses. And um, in the future, if I'm voted back onto the council, I would like to, um, there's a program um, that the state has to help businesses reduce their energy costs, and I would like to get that started in the next year or two to help them with that. So, uh, I mean, first off, I just want to uh, thank Councilmember Biskins for the work um, that she and the council have um, done in supporting um, small businesses through the facade program um, and other efforts. I uh, So I personally have not had my own business per se. Um, I have worked independently as a consultant and so managing, um, you know, budgets and my own um, time and resources that way have um, been something that I am well versed in. But more so, I am a huge advocate for supporting our small and local business owners. And I have had so many conversations over the course of this campaign and just over the course of my career with um, small businesses. They, you know, I, right now our small businesses are, you know, not only facing the regular challenges of what it's like being a small business owner and, um, you know, make, paying staff and, um, you know, making making ends meet every day, but we are in a global pandemic, and that's been particularly devastating 
for some of my favorite small businesses in this community, which are in the hospitality industry. And so, you know, making sure that they have access to resources, not only within the city, but at other levels of government as well. Um, I've been involved in business since I was in my early 20s. I've owned a couple of different printing businesses, as well as a printing brokerage uh, in Colorado. I was involved in a family restaurant in Colorado and was a part owner of that, of that endeavor. And I'm currently um, a clinical, um, a clinician in substance abuse, in the substance abuse field, <clears throat> excuse me. In between that, while I was at the airline, I also worked, it was not a small business, but it was, um, it required a lot of investment personally and professionally as an employee assistance chair for the flight attendant union. So I've got great experience and I've had multi-level managerial experience through the printing industry throughout my past um, decades. Mm, okay, well, um, I did help uh, help run and manage a small tattoo shop in Northeast Minneapolis for about five years. Um, and of course that involves many different levels of management when it comes to, to managing customers, to managing budgets, to making sure that everything you're doing is within code, um, etc. Uh, I've been a program staff for uh, summer camps for a number of years, um, but the most interesting job that I've had as far as a small business goes is, um, as a musician, I've managed bands for about 20 years. I always end up in that position when I'm in a band. I'm not sure why, but uh, I draw the shortest draw. I, <laughs> but I'm in marketing, supplies, budget, schedule, costs, staff problems, um, lots of issues in trying to put on a, a musical show without a hitch, and there's always a hitch. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and it, it's one that I care a lot about, because um, I make my, you know, uh, political views and values very clear, um, and, you know, that's because I want to be transparent, but that doesn't um, mean that I um, have not worked and I'm unwilling to work across the political spectrum. Um, my track record throughout my career has proven that. And it's one of the things that I just love about local government. Um, because I imagine many of you who are watching this today watched the debate last night. And I think there's a very, very different kind of governing um, that can happen at the local level because we're working on things that are you know, really deep and personal to people's everyday lives and because we're small enough so that we can know our individual neighbors and have relationships. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I have um, gotten to have good relationships with everyone on um, the council and, you know, most everyone running um, during this time. And, um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, um, I've done a lot of teamwork throughout my um, careers in, in business associations that require you to be um, to look at the facts of any particular set of circumstances and operate on the on the the facts as well as the input from your teammates so that you can come to a consensus and find the resolution that's necessary. I don't see that as being problematic. Um, quite extensive experience doing that. Well, uh, to start with, of course, I, I, my minor was in group dynamics and conflict resolution, but, you know, that's book stuff, and that's all great. Um, a lot of good buzzwords, a lot of good information that you can play around with and throw around, but the truth is 90% um, of having a good conversation with someone is done with your ears. You have to listen. You have to listen to what they're saying. Before you even think of what you're going to say next, think about what they're saying. Analyze it. Try to understand their point of view um, instead of spending so much time trying to throw yours at them. Um, I think the most important thing is to stay positive. Um, there's no room for negativity. Um, within ourselves or within people around us, we have to stay positive. We have to try to keep that line of communication open and positive. Um, having been on the council for the last three and a half years, I've learned a lot about working with a team. Um, listening is a big thing and respecting other people's view, even though I don't always agree with it. And the one big thing is compromise. 
coming together, we may not, each side or whoever the different views are with, may not, we may not all get what we want at the time, but if we can come together and compromise and at least work out something that helps on a project that helps improve the community, that's better. And then also I've learned to let go of projects I felt passionate about, but the rest of the council wasn't ready for it or didn't agree with it. And that's a big thing to learn to let go and still be respectful of the other people and move on to the next project or idea. Well, I'm glad you used the word exclusivity because I believe that that is the core. It's about um, being inclusive rather than exclusive. Uh, we win when we decide to embrace the uncomfortable and have the conversations about systemic racism, sexism, fears, and misconceptions. I would hope that through education and opening those doors, making providing a comfort level for um, the entire community, that that would open the door to the education that's necessary to become more accepting. And I think that's what will take us down the path. This is a big part of why I ran. Um, and it, that sounds strange because, yeah, white male, here I am. Um, I was not my first choice to run. I ran because um, I was asked to. And um, I think it's important that we, first and foremost, establish an environment where people of color, LBTQIA uh, people feel like they are in a safe place where they can express their feelings and say their views and not feel judged, not feel shoved aside a little. Um, and we do that by listening. And if I do my job right, I won't need to run next time because there will be people of color that want this seat and I will offer that to them. Um, first off, I do believe that institutional racism does exist and I personally have asked uh, friends, people I know from ethnic communities in our community to run for commissions and run for council. Um, I have voted for people from um, different ethnic groups to be on our commissions and um, I have, we have talked in amongst ourselves on, for the city hall to make a connection with the schools to see if we can have students come and shadow people in our city, um, different departments, so they can learn what the city does. It might be spur their interest in uh, getting a degree and working in um, serving the public. Um, I also um, would like the city, the student council from our high school to come run their council meetings here to get that experience of being on tape and, and being in a room that helps run a city or else run a, um, a, a, their own city council for the city. So there's lots of different ways that we can start bringing folks in um, and of all different backgrounds and colors and, and groups to uh, feel comfortable in the city. So. Yeah, so first off, I, I wanna say um, when I hear people talk a lot about um, the impact of racism in our community. Um, I don't hear a lot about people talking about the distinction between institutional and interpersonal racism. And interpersonal racism is definitely something we all need to work on and is that like welcoming and having building relationships. But it's the in institutional piece um, that it's not unique to Columbia Heights, it's across the board in the United States. Um, you know, we were, we were founded with, um, you know, a, on white supremacy on the um, on the backs of our um, indigenous communities, and um, yeah, I I also throughout the the campaign have been able to just meet so many wonderful neighbors, um, and oftentimes when I hear people talk about this question, you know, there it seems to be there's this othering rather than you know they are part of um, the community with us, but you know what are I don't. Think it's a matter of you know education or interest but it's a matter of how um, the institutions have operated for so long all right thank you well um i started smoking cigarettes when i was in eighth grade to be cool uh, i started with menthols uh, smoked on and off through high school and i smoked until my daughter was born when i was 40. And I, um, so far, haven't paid for it, but I'm probably going to pay for it eventually. Um, it's a terrible habit. It's, 
it's uh, it's more addictive than heroin. It's a it's a terrible problem, and I wish nobody would try it. Um, and I I very much support um, banning these flavored um, tobacco products. It's we all know who the tobacco companies are catering to uh, to try to get these uh, get people using these products. It's for kids, and it needs to stop. Um, I too don't support smoking. I know it's a difficult habit to break for people, um, and I'm glad that the state has done many things over the years to make it more difficult to smoke. Um, as far as banning, um, adding more restrictions, I don't have a knowledge background to know what types of restrictions they could be, so I'd be open to learning more about it. And also vaping, there's so many health issues now that have come up with vaping. I definitely would want to learn more about how uh, we as a city council could play a role in controlling that even more because yes, kids should not have any access to those um, uh, smoking materials. Yeah, um, this is an important question. I, I think there's a clear consensus in the public health community um, about um, how impactful um, an ordinance um, limiting tobacco sales um, to those over the age of 21. Um, like Andy mentioned, starting when smoking when you are really young um, has a big impact. Um, and I see now firsthand with my own, um, I'm the oldest of five kids, so I've watched my siblings grow up and um, how you know even them and their friends have started vaping and just the rise of that business. And so, um, Yes, I, you know, I'm not going to say with 100% certainty what those restrictions would be. Um, I'd want them to be grounded in both public health and um, the community's um, opinions. And I also would really, rather than focusing on um, a local ordinance too, I would really advocate to um, further at the state legislature and at the federal level because when when we do things municipality by municipality, um, you know, we're seeing like small business move out of our community and so how can we do it on a larger scale? Thanks. Um, I would definitely support uh, restrictions. Um, being a smoker for about 30 to 35 years as much as two packs a day, I can speak firsthand to how difficult it is to quit and I have been smoke free for um, about 10 or 12 years. It's a very tough battle and, I, and it, it was a battle I fought many, many times. Um, I think part of the issue is educating our younger people. It, 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 we need to restrict, restrict it to full uh, legal, legal aged adults, but we need to find a way to educate the younger people so that they don't start. If they've already started by the time they're before they're 21, that clearly is going to impact um, their uses as teenagers and as they get older. Um, definitely a lot of things need to be done at the state and federal level, and we need to go after the manufacturers as well. Um, first off, as far as improving property values, um, the city hasn't had to do too much right now because we're still, still a hot spot. Um, every time I get a chance to look, to see what the sales are doing in the city, and we may have less than a dozen houses up for sale. They're still going well, and the prices are going up, which is part of the reason our fiscal disparity didn't, wasn't as high as we wanted to because we're doing better than what we've done in the past. Um, as far as improving residential, um, there has been discussion that I've had with council members in the past about what we can do to help his, um, homeowners. Um, we were focused on renters, but um, we're still working on that, and I would like to find ways that we can help homeowners with questions that they have and how they can improve their housing. Um, the second part of the question. What would you do to increase property values and widen the tax base without forcing out low-income communities and encouraging segregation? Yeah, the tax, the tax base is a really tough question to do because right now it's 3.5%, and just hiring one person increases it by 1.5% at least sometimes. Um, it's a very tough question that we deal with when we're going through the budget, and I know the staff, um, it's a very big struggle to make sure that we don't take it too high because I don't want people who are low income to leave the city. Yeah, so um, also a very deeply personal question um, for me. I Before coming to Heights, I lived in North East Minneapolis, which is facing this question head on, as well as our urban communities across the country. Um, you know, I don't think anyone has the perfect answer to, to solve these issues. Um, and then in terms of raising property value, um, 
yeah, I definitely want there to be a balance. I have a lot of concerns about it. Um, I said in the previous forum, I'm a low income myself, a person myself. I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. And gosh, I learned that over, uh, you know, the two years that I have had my home, it's risen in value um, by $20,000. And, you know, I think about, you know, if I was looking at purchasing that home now, that's, that would have um, pushed it outside of my budget range. So how do we make sure that there are opportunities for our low-income um, neighbors um, and, you know, our immigrants and communities of color to own property, um, but also making sure that we are a vibrant, thriving community? Um, and in terms of uh, taxation, I definitely want to see, you know, we're the housing crisis that exists, um, particularly in Minneapolis, is only pushing north. And so opportunities to build more housing, um, especially multi or mixed multi-unit um, housing in transit corridors like Central Avenue. Um, I'm going to address this, I think, in reverse. I, I think part of the tax-based question is bringing business, viable businesses into, uh, into the community that can help support um, the needs of the community while also providing some of that tax, that tax base that, that would help residents. I've seen um, residents come forward with increases of 30% in, in a year in their tax uh, responsibilities, and that's not market value. There's more going on there, and, and that's very, very troubling to see that happen. I think one way we can um, keep moving forward in a positive way while not excluding renters and not forcing people out of the community is to look at bringing in affordable housing as well as all of the, the uh, low-income housing that we uh, have in the city. This new development on the corner of 40th and Central for the City Hall is the first time in over 10 years that we're bringing in market housing rental units. So that's a move in the right direction. Okay, um, I think honestly, uh, one of the most important things we can look at is our renters. Um, not, it's, it's great to have this solid group of homeowners in town that are so invested in their town, but um, I'm not of the belief that renters are less invested in the community. Um, I think that if renters are in quality homes and are if, if renters are in a place that is uh, well taken care of, that that we are aware of, that we look after. I'm sorry. Okay, are you done? I think I'm done. Okay. Great. Uh, I love this question. It's good to end on a positive note. Um, as I do it all the time, and that's like I said, one of the reasons that I run. Um, you know, people kind of laughed at me because I, you know, talk about heights like it's some like magical unicorn land. And it's, you know, we have a lot of challenges that we face. But one of the things that I really love about the community is just um, our, you know, wonderful neighbors that live here. I was just struck when I moved into my home just how like, um, you know, great and people really care for one another and, I, you know, I think are, are looking out for the right things. And, um, and I love that. Um, yeah, it's, we're also a great location in the in the North Metro. We have wonderful, um, diverse businesses, including some great local restaurants. Um, and yeah, what what else can I say? Those are some of my top things. Um, we have great parks as well. Um, uh, that's one of the things you know I talk about in infrastructure and improving. But we are very lucky to have um, an awesome park system and great places to hike and recreate with our families and our pets. Thanks. When I moved here 27 years ago, um, one of the things that brought me to Columbia Heights, I was a renter at the time, and what caused me to look for a, a home in Columbia Heights was the fact that it was had such a great hometown feel. And I can say that 27 years later, we still have that same hometown feel and that sense of community among the neighbors. Um, we have probably, I, I I don't have this statistically, but I would venture to say we probably have more parks in Columbia Heights for being less than four square miles than probably any other community, I think, in, in um, Minnesota, except for, for the Boundary Waters, maybe. Um, we're fortunate to have a park system and a park and rec system that utilizes those facilities. 
So it's the hometown mm -hmm. feel. It's the things, the, the ways that you can become involved in Columbia Heights, whether it be through civic organizations or um, just working at SECA to, to help those in need. We have a lot to offer. Right, before I get to that, just real quick, commercial property, let's get Heidi built. <laughs> and the other thing is, for, as far as the rentals, uh, what I'm saying is let's focus on the quality of our rentals. Let's make sure they're up to code, let's make sure people are in quality housing, and that will uh, make a big difference. Now, as far as what we have to be proud of, a lot. First off is actually our police. Uh, our police are incredible. It's, it's, it's pretty great to be part of a community whose police force is considered a role model, and they are, concerning officer diversity, de-escalation techniques, non-legal options, overall conduct with community. I am, am continually impressed with our police. Um, <clears throat> next thing is our restaurants. It's incredible how many foods you can get within just one square mile. You can go get Indian, you can have Ethiopian. The Ethiopian restaurant's amazing. Um, <clears throat> You can get Mexican food, you can get American food. <laughs> and third of all, of course, I'm a parks guy, is our parks. Our parks are incredible and they're only going to get better. Um, first off, we're a great city with great people in this city. Um, we have a very eclectic, very diverse population. I have people from Russia, Morocco, uh, Somali, um, Mexico, Ecuador. Um, in my neighborhood, it's, and I love it. Um, it also, the biggest thing though is that we have a small town feel, and what's exciting is that the new people that have moved into this town have picked up that thread and are continuing that small town feel. I've met people six years ago individually, and now they all know each other, and it was all across the city. It's just amazing. And the other thing that's super exciting is lots of energy. Because of that diversity, because of that eclectic feel, we have a very energized and active community in our town, and part of me almost wants to keep it a secret, but we have a great town with great people. Well, I want to thank you, Ms. Sable, for the opportunity for our, to be our, our moderator in the league for hosting this important opportunity, and more importantly, I want to thank the residents and the community for taking time to hear us this evening. Um, I think an important piece to remember is that this is not a personality race, it's not a party race, it's about global, not about global issues or the communities that surround us, this is about Columbia Heights, our, it's our backyard, your community, it's, it's about electing a person with the best skill set to accomplish what is best for this community at large, and that community is you, the taxpayers. My presence at Council Chambers brought me to this candidacy, my candidacy did not bring me to Council Chambers. No one has done my speaking for me. I am a viable candidate because I have consistently and long-term been proactive, resourceful, invested, dedicated, and engaged in Columbia Heights and its residents. I've been present. I believe the best choice on November 3rd is Katie Jacobs. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say exactly what I said last time, honestly. Um, on top of saying thank you very much, um, all of you, thank you for uh, let me start with this. I'm a straight white male in America. I have privileged a lot of it to deny this, or to deny any understanding of how we can improve. Um, a year ago at this time, the LB, LGBTQ community was denied the acknowledgement of just one day of recognition, recognition by the proclamation. But the current mayor, by way of writing a policy that beforehand had not existed, as a committed ally, I could not let this be the end of it. I joined with others within the community to write a citizen, citizen's proclamation to be read and signed at Pride. This also planted the seeds of my eventual candidacy. I am running to make sure voices are heard and listened to. I am running to establish a safer and more accessible city government where all people, uh, people of all color, faiths, youth, old, youth, young, old, lifelong residents, new families, people with disabilities, where everyone can feel they have equity they have a seat at the table, they have a voice of their own, and then we're listening. First off, thank you to the League of City Voters for hosting this forum and to the folks out there who are watching us. Um, uh, first off, I enjoy being a service to the residents of our city. I enjoy getting the phone calls from residents when they need help with something, and I try my best to try to find a solution um, if possible. I've worked very hard in the last three and a half years to help improve our city and I would like your vote to help me continue um, working hard to improve the quality of life in our city so that we all can benefit from it. Thank you. Yeah, 
Um, well, like everyone has said, thank you so much to the League of uh, Women Voters. I've long loved this organization. My grandma um, got me involved in the St. Paul ch chapter at an early age. Um, and I want to really thank all of my neighbors out there um, watching and any friends and family that are watching as well for taking time on a Wednesday night to listen uh, to all of us talk about this lovely community of Columbia Heights. Um, I also want to thank Councilmember Biskins um, and current Councilmember Bobby Williams for your service um, to the council and bringing your voice to the, um, the campaign this year, um, as well as all of the candidates that have run. Um, yeah, I um, believe I um, am the, the strongest uh, candidate for um, this position because I do, I, I bring an extensive um, background and a really strong vision um, and a community-centered uh, um, uh, value that I will um, take with me and uh, when I step into this role on um, day one. Um, so thank you so much, and I look forward to working with all of you, whether or not I'm elected. Thanks. Thank you, candidates, for speaking to voters about issues and for running for the Council of Columbia Heights. Thank you, viewers, for your interest in becoming informed voters. You should know that Columbia Heights is part of State Senate District 41 and State House District 41B. We've also done forums like this for candidates for those offices, and you can watch those again at the LWV ABC website or on our YouTube channel, LWV ABC. You can also um, watch forums on, oh, I did that, ABC YouTube channel. The recorded sessions are also available on Columbia Heights Facebook Live of this meeting and of City of Columbia Heights YouTube channel. And then again, this will be rebroadcast periodically on local channels 16 and 19. Of course, it's really important that we vote. You have many options for how to vote. If you go to mnvotes.org, you can learn about those options. You can come right here to City Hall and vote anytime now. You can also request an absentee ballot and vote whenever you like. If you wish to register to vote or upstate your reservation, reser if you need to register to vote or update your registration, you can do that online or when you go to vote, so you don't have to do it in advance. Make your voice heard in the general election by voting on or before November 3rd. Thank you and stay healthy and safe.